Hey everyone, this is Ron Coddington from Military Images Magazine. I am coming to you live from our headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Very, very happy to have you with us this evening. And uh, before we get started with tonight's episode, I do want to say a few words about Military Images Magazine. As you know, we've been around since 1979 and we are the only magazine in America that is solely dedicated to Civil War portrait photography. If you're a subscriber, I thank you for being part of our community and your interest in Civil War photography and American history. If you are not a subscriber, now is a great chance to uh, join our army of subscribers. So uh, in fact, maybe right now uh, is not the time, but wait until this episode is over and then you can go and check out militaryimagesmagazine.com or you can go right to shopmilitaryimages.com and find out about our subscriptions and pick the plan that's right for you. We have a print subscription, we have a digital subscription and a print plus digital subscription. So check us out. Super happy to have you with us here tonight. And uh, I want to get into the program by talking about uh, a, uh, gosh, a, a primary source document that is unlike no other. And that is Civil War Pension Files. And let me get into the Zoom, pres or pardon me, into our uh, presentation. And uh, we will uh, get going. I am going to share my screen with you and uh, we will get this presentation going. So here we go. All righty. This is, as I mentioned, uh, in the in the run up on social media on Facebook, uh, inside an Iron Brigade pension. And um, uh, let's take a look at this photograph. Uh, this is a carte de visite of a sergeant, and um, he is standing in front of a backdrop which has uh, a, a wonderfully painted bucolic scene that has a balcony, it has a column, it has trees, there's a water feature. Uh, he has his hand on a chair, and uh, it's nicely painted so that it blends right into the floor upon which he stands. Now, this soldier is Theodore Doche Bond of the 2nd Wisconsin Infantry. He also served in the Veteran Reserve Corps. And I've put his life dates up here for you, 1833 to 1912. So he survived the war and lived a good long life after that. Now, we know this because on the back of the mount of this carte de visite, we have the signature, yours truly. Uh, he's abbreviated his first name, Theodore Dosh Bon, and you can see his company letter H, and then second abbreviated to D and Wisconsin. We also see the photographer's back mark. This is Evans and Prince, who were photographers in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, the Evans and Prince factory, uh, photographic factory, they put the number of the negative on the back of this mount, 5185, so that the soldier could go ahead and order extra copies if he wanted to. Now, uh, this backdrop was immediately familiar to me even before I knew the name on the back. Evans and Prince is fairly prolific. They had a lot of traffic coming through York because of its hub of union activity and the fact that it was a hospital town. There was a large general hospital there. I'm giving you uh, an image of this unidentified young woman who is standing in front of the same backdrop by Ab Evans and Prince. Some of the later uh, Evans and Prince photographs had their name and you can see it, right? If you look along the bottom of her skirt uh, and to the right, you'll see just a little bit of the name. Evans is blocked out by her dress, but you can see 
NS and Prince, photo period, the abbreviation for photographer, and then York PA. Um, the image of Sergeant Bond does not have that particular signature on it, but nonetheless, it's the same backdrop and the same back mark of Evans and Prince. Now, if you go to uh, HDS, uh, the well-known sites uh, from historical data systems and look up Theodore's record, uh, you'll get the basics. And many of those who use the site are very familiar with this tan background and the very simple description that you get. And within that simplicity, you find out some important details about Sergeant Bond. We're confirming that he was a member of Company H of the 2nd Wisconsin. We're confirming that he was in the Veteran Reserve Corps. We can see that he was wounded twice at Bull Run on July 21st, 1861. So that's the first Battle of Bull Run. And then we see again that he was wounded on July 1st, 1863 at Gettysburg. We also see that he started out as a corporal and was later promoted to sergeant. Now, here's a close up to give you a better look at all that information that we can get from HDS. Uh, if we now look at his military, military service record from which the HDS information was taken, I'm just gonna show you uh, a little bit of it just to uh, give you a sense of what those records are all about. But the basic definition of a military service record is it contains the soldier's monthly or quarterly reports. It has miscellaneous papers, including enlistment documents, casualty reports, prisoner of war records, additional uh, resignations, all kinds of paperwork that's related to their service. Um, I find it extremely helpful as a way to get some additional detail once I have found their record on HDS. And so here's a couple of pages from that military service record. The first one here is the envelope that holds those records. Uh, this is his Veteran Reserve Corps record. You can see here, he was in the 108th Company, 2nd Battalion of the VRC. He was a sergeant during his enlistment, and there were five records that were associated with his service. A couple of those records are here. Uh, they tell you that he was at the General Hospital at York, Pennsylvania, which connects very nicely with the photographers, Evans and Prince, who operated in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, we can see that he enlisted in Madison, Wisconsin. We get a basic description, his hair color, his height. Uh, that information, if you flip these two records over, you're going to get a little bit more information. On the back of that second record, we get some collab corroborating information. Uh, it says Gettysburg gunshot wound, next line, neck, first bull run. And so a little bit more of a confirmation. There's still some questions that are behind that. <clears throat> now, we come to the pension file, uh, the centerpiece of this show. For those of you who know the pension file, great. Uh, and if you know its value, even greater. For those of you who are new to researching Civil War soldiers, let me, let me introduce you to the pension file. I like to think of it as a time capsule. When you think about the documentation that's included in these files, we're looking at the history of a soldier, the history of a family. Uh, it's, it's wonderful material. Uh, so if you were the veteran or the veteran's immediate family, the value proposition for you is it contains applications, affidavits, physicians' reports, and other supporting evidence that enabled you um, or your wife or your dependent children or your mother or your father to get uh, money, get benefits as a result of your Civil War service, which include, could include a disability of some kind. Now, 
if you, the researcher, the value proposition is that it confirms the basic facts of the soldier service, it adds details that in many cases, you're really not gonna find anywhere else. And it also includes the genealogical information. So if you're looking for family information or you're looking to include the soldier to other members of a family, uh, this is a great place to do it. Now, I should also tell you that, uh, or I should also make you aware that a pension file is written by soldiers and their families who are trying to get benefits. And the government is grilling them because they want to guarantee that the person is who or who he says or who she says he is. And so there's, there's a lot of supporting material. It's really a collection of legal documents in many ways. Uh, so you have to sort of put that frame on when you're looking at it. So when you go into these files, though they're filled with fantastic information, have a healthy skepticism. Remember who's writing, who is supporting the documents. Uh, keep in mind that the government is asking a bunch of questions because they want to know who you are. And so there's a lot of back and forth that goes on there. So keep that in mind as you're going through. Now, I'm going to go to over to fold three, uh, because some of you, if you haven't been to the National Archives, or if the soldier you're looking for does not have a full pension file on fold three, and let me put a parenthesis here, fold three is Ancestry.com's military collection of documents. They have scanned probably millions of documents at this point from the National Archives and are putting them on the site. So the entry point into pension files through fold three are these pension indexes and they include application numbers as you can see in this example and some basic dates uh, of the soldier service, including his rank, his company, all that information. Uh, if you're actually to go to the National Archives, you have to file a form that includes the numbers that you see on this particular document to get the actual pension that I'm about to show you. So let's dig in. Uh, Theodore's file contains 80 pages of documents. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of them because we'll be here for a long time, but I'm gonna hit the highlights. Before I do that, I know that in my experience in researching over at the archives, I've found pension files that include less than 10 documents and more than 200. So the range is terrific. Uh, the less than 10 pages, by the way, was a Civil War nurse, and the 200 plus pages was a soldier who served in a US colored infantry regiment who couldn't provide, couldn't prove the basic facts of his life. Uh, he was a slave before the war, and the government had to send special agents down to his southern home to find out the basics of his birth date, his marriage date, all of that kind of thing. So that added a number of pages to the document. So 80 pages is about average. Now, if you like paper, I'm just gonna geek out for a minute here because I love paper. I love the color, I love the smell, I love the topography, I love the way it's printed, I love everything about it. So when you open up one of these pension files, if you're one of, if you're like me and you love that paper, uh, this, this alone, forget about even uh, digesting the information, just the papers alone, the various colors, the various sizes, uh, early typewriters being used, it's just wonderful. So you get uh, this example here with tape on it. Um, you've got this wonderful parchment, heavy parchment uh, piece of paper, which is a wonderful steel engraving on it. So this is just a little bit of what you're going to find in these files. Uh, this piece of paper here I wanted to show you because as I was taking the photograph 
of it. The paper itself had been folded so tightly and apparently it seems like it hadn't been unfolded in perhaps a hundred years. So the archives will give you these little, um, uh, they're little sacks that have something inside that I'm not sure what's inside, uh, but you can lay them delicately, uh, gingerly on top of the delicate paper so that you can spread them out so that you can take a photograph. And by the way, uh, if you're at the archives, you can use your, your phone to take pictures. That's a relatively recent um, ability uh, that you have if you're visiting. So let's get into some of the basic documents that you're going to find in a pension file. This is that treasure trove of information that I spoke about earlier, that time capsule. Um, the kinds of documents that you're going to find. In this case, here's Theodore's original uh, application that he made in 1890. And this application has several pages and he details parts of his war experience, hitting the highlights, in this case, emphasizing the fact that he was wounded at Bull Run and wounded at Gettysburg. Uh, you've got this document. This is prepared by government clerks. It's a record verification. Once the application is submitted by, or was submitted by Theodore Bonn, uh, the clerks are going to make a request to get his records. And you can see that um, several clerks have dutifully copied out just the highlights of his military service. And they copied these monthly muster records and other documents just to give the Pension Bureau enough information to prove that Theodore Bond was in fact a sergeant in the second Wisconsin. Now, you've also got things like the surgeon certificate. This is really important if you're applying for a disability pension you're going to see these kinds of certificates. They're not always filled out with this level of detail. Well, what we have here on the back of one of the sheets of the surgeon certificate is diagrams, obviously here, of the human body. In this case, they're detailing his wounds. And the human figure on the left looking towards us you can see where the examining surgeon has highlighted the location of the bullet wound that he received in the left side at Gettysburg. And by the way, this, it looks so clinical here, but the story behind this particular wound is that uh, according to his own testimony, it happened early on during the first charge on the first day's battle, about 30 yards from where Major General John F. Reynolds was killed. And the wound knocked him over. It was difficult for him to walk, but he managed to make his way into town to the Adams County Courthouse, which by that time was being used as a makeshift hospital. They had begun clearing out all of the tables and chairs to make room for the wounded who were pouring in. And from there, he ultimately gets to, guess what? He goes to York, Pennsylvania. So the diagram on the right, which is a, uh, a back view of a human figure, shows that gunshot, the entrance point is coming in uh, at the top of his right shoulder and the exit of that bullet is coming out um, uh, sort of at the base of his neck uh, and back on the uh, right hand hand side. So if you go through his records and find other references, depending upon what document you're looking at, some of them, like his military service record, uh, say that he was wounded in the neck. And they are clearly making a reference to one or two of those wounds. It's very close to the right shoulder. Other documents say, well, he was wounded in the right shoulder. This document really helps us to understand that both the neck and the right shoulder were involved in this particular injury. As I showed you earlier, you've got this wonderful parchment document. Um, this is his original certificate. This is one that he applied for 
when he received uh, an increase in pay. And to prove that, here's a document that comes along with it that says that he was able to get an increase thanks to a pension act in 1907. Uh, then we move, uh, we're going through a bunch of papers here. We get to this document that says that he has died. Uh, and this document dates from uh, May of 1912. What normally happens is the government sends the paycheck, or I should say the benefits check to the soldier. And uh, if the soldier is dead, that check is oftentimes returned by the family. And that prompts the filling out of this document. So you can see on the left side, he's described as dead. And on the right side, he has been formally dropped from the rolls. Now, uh, we also have his death certificate to have proof of his death. These death certificates are really valuable for the genealogist because you've got information about his full name, his his mother's name, his father's name, the name of his wife, uh, his marital status, his cause of death, and who reported the death. Uh, and so there's a bunch of information, his address. All this information is extremely helpful if you're trying to establish um, the basic details around his death and where he was uh, when he passed. So uh, the file doesn't end there because his wife, Hattie, survived him. And so uh, she filed for a widow's pension at that point. And you can see here, this dates to 1912 when she went ahead and had that uh, approval done. So here is her file. And if you continue on, you can see that she includes in her document um, when she was married, when she was born. There's even a wedding certificate uh, that was included in the document. And uh, you can see at some point, she writes to the pension bureau and she says, I'd like to have my marriage certificate uh, and my disability, my husband's disability pension file returned. And of course, uh, the govern government documenting every aspect of what's going on, uh, a clerk makes a note that the discharge certificate was returned to the widow. There's another document that mentions the marriage certificate was returned. So you've also got, uh, now we're getting towards the end of the file. You've got a member of Congress from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is where the Bonds lived after the war, making inquiries about the pension. And the reason for this uh, letter, which is dated 1930, is uh, because Hattie died. She died that year. And uh, the son of Hattie and Theodore Walter is asking questions about what's, I know she was getting a benefit. I'm not quite sure what she was getting. Um, what are we entitled to do? And how do I notify you? So uh, here is the death certificate for Hattie, likely sent in by Walter or requested by the government. It has all of her information, which again, is extremely helpful if you're trying to line up those family genealogies. Uh, one of the last documents in the file is Walter's application to be reimbursed for Hattie's funeral fees, in this case, $195 uh, for the body preparation, the casket, the hearse, flowers, et cetera. And that is the end of the pension file of Theodore Hattie and Walter Bond. And uh, I wanted to give you, share this with you tonight, just to give you a little sense of what one of these pension files are all about. Now, these files are all over the place. Recall that I mentioned they can contain few documents or a couple hundred documents. You will find uh, original letters. You will find original photographs. You will find letters that document fights that have been going on in the family for years. Uh, it, it, it runs the gamut. So uh, when you get into these files, as I mentioned, have a healthy skepticism. And also have, uh, one thing I did mention is have some respect. Um, you're dealing with 
the documents of uh, a veteran and his family who served. And these are not necessarily doc documents that you want to gawk about and, and poke fun at. This is somebody's life. And um, use the information responsibly is where I'm trying to go with this. So have respect for the information, use it wisely, make sure that you do your proper documentation so that whatever you do with it, if you're going to write a profile of a soldier or if you're gonna document it for your own interests, for your own collection, or perhaps for your family, um, it's all there for you. So uh, that's the end of tonight's presentation. If you enjoyed this program, and I hope you did, I thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, don't forget, if you're a subscriber, I give you a tip of the cap and a big thank you. Your support is what helps the magazine keep going. It helps me to do what I'm doing. And most importantly, it helps to showcase, interpret, and preserve these stories of soldiers. If you're not, I should also say sailors and nurses and that whole generation of individuals who participated indirectly and directly in the Civil War. So uh, check us out. If you're not a subscriber, check us out at militaryimagesmagazine.com or go to shopmilitaryimages.com. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Take care. Have a good night.